All right, so if we want to integrate the expression 5e to the 2x plus 1 over x, we're going to take the antiderivative of 5e to the 2x, and all we have to do there is divide by the exponent or the coefficient of 2x, so then we would get 5e to the 2x divided by 2, and then the antiderivative of 1 over x would be the natural log of the absolute value of x. Let's not forget our constants. Remember that you can check these answers because if you take the derivative of this expression, you should get this, and that's what you'll get. So the answer would be b. All right, number two. So if you want to find f prime of four for this function, we're going to take the derivative of this function, and then we just plug in four into x and evaluate. So remember, this is the same as x to the 1 half. That's the same thing as the square root of x. And this is the same as plus 3 times x to the negative 1 half. So we take the derivative here. We just use the power rule. So it would be 1 half times x to the negative 1 half minus one half times three, so minus three halves, times x to the negative three halves. Take away one from the exponent. And if you want to write this out we, in a more you know clean way, that's fine. But we're going to plug in four into here. So f prime of four would be one over two, and remember x to the negative one half is just like the square root of x. So 1 over 2 times the square root of 4 minus 3 over 2. x to the negative 3 halves is just like x times the square root of x in the denominator. So we're going to have x where we'll just have 4 times the square root of 4 in the denominator. So we evaluate this, this is just 1 over 2 times 2, so 1 over 4 minus 3 over 8 times 2 minus 3 over 16. So this is 4 sixteenths minus 3 sixteenths, and so you get 1 sixteenth. So your answer is A. Alright, problem 3. Okay, so if we want to integrate this, we're going to want to use u substitution. So we're going to make u equal to x cubed plus 5. And that means that du will be 3x squared. Now, we have u in here. So we have like u to the 6 there. We don't have 3x squared, but we have just x squared. So we divide this by 3. So we have 1 third du is equal to x squared dx, and that should actually put the dx here. And so then we have exactly this left over. So we can rewrite this integral as one third u to the sixth du. And from here, this is easy to integrate because we can just use the power or reverse power rule. So we have one third times u to the seventh over seven plus our constant c. And all we do is replace our u with our x cubed plus five. And then we'll have one third or one twenty one x cubed plus five to the seventh plus c. And that's exactly what we have here. So that'll be our answer. All right, problem four. If we have the values of a continuous function for these selected values of x are given in this table. So what's the value of the left Riemann sum approximation to the integral from 0 to 50 of f of x? And we're going to use these subintervals. So we're going to go by 25, 5, and then 20. Okay, so let's actually um let's actually draw like a little sketch of what 
this is, because that's going to really help you understand the, these types of problems. So remember, these are just y coordinates on a, on a graph, so on an xy plane. So when x is 0, y is 4. So we have a point here at 0, 4. When x is 25, y is 6. So we'll say that says 25, 6. When x is 30, y is 8. This is not drawn to scale. So we have another point at 30, 8. And then when y is, or when x is 50, y is 12. So we'll just say 50 is over there. Point at 50, 12. So, um, so this is a continuous function. We don't necessarily know exactly what's going on between these points, um, but let's just let's just assume to kind of make this um, a little more clear. Let's just assume that it, it just connects with like a line that you know continues to go up. Again, we don't know what's going on. It could, it could very well dip down and pop back up, or pop up and pack, go back down. All we know is that it goes through these points without any um, without any gaps. So. The idea is to understand that we're going to basically use a sum of rectangles to approximate the area underneath this function. So when it says left Riemann sum, that simply means use these left or use these points as the top left corners of rectangles. So if we make a rectangle from that first one, we would have that. The second one, you do get this. The third one would look like this. And um, that's all you would have to worry about for that. Now, um, here, let's think about um, what's what's going on. So, from from for so for a re for a rectangle, let's just make it. Let me just make it three rectangles: a one, a two, a three. The area of a rectangle is just base times height. The base of the first rectangle is just 25, and the height is 4. So you do 25 times 4 for that first area. The area of the second one is just this base length, which is now 5, times the height, which is 6. So we do 5 times 6 plus the width of this rectangle, plus the area of this rectangle, which is going to have a width of 20 and a height of 8. So we do 20 times 8. And so we just simply get 100 and looks like 130 plus 160. So we'll get 290. So our answer is 8. So again, um, when, you're, when you're practicing this stuff, Really try to create a visual, at least mentally, because it's really, it's really intuitive. It's very simple. It's just basic geometry. Um, so just pay attention to like if it says left or right hand. That's really the only difference you have to worry about. Anyways, all right. So the next one we have for what function or for what value? See if any is f continuous at x equals two. Okay, so we have a piecewise function. So for it to be continuous at x equals two. That essentially means that this function has to connect to this function at 2. So that means when you plug 2 into this, let's say that you would get you know, 2 squared times the sine of pi times 2, so times the sine of pi times 2. It should equal the same value when you plug 2 into there. So it should equal 2 squared plus 2c minus 18. So you're just going to solve this equation. C. So we get 4 times the sine of 2 pi, which is a 0. 4 minus 18, so negative 14 plus 2c. This is just 0. So you just get 14 equals 2c, and so you get c equals 7. So 
the answer is B. All right, which of these is the antiderivative of 3 secant squared of x plus 2? So you're essentially just going to want to find the answer where if you took the derivative of the answer, you would get this. So you basically just have to know your um, derivatives. So um, there's not really much more to say. I mean, I know it's going to be this one because um, the derivative tangent of x is secant squared of x. And we're just going to multiply that by 3. And the derivative of 2x is just 2. So your answer is going to be b. Um, for your, when, you, when you take your AP Calc test, you're definitely going to have to need to know the cosine and sine function derivatives. And usually the tangent and secant, usually the tangents. Sometimes you'll, yeah, you'll need cosecant, secant, um, cotangent. But really, make sure you know the cosine, sine, and tangent, because those are the most common ones. All right, for number seven, um, if we have that f is f of x is x squared minus four, and g is the differentiable function of x, what's the derivative of f of g of x? Okay, so this is just going to imply or uh, um, require the use of chain rule. So we're, the derivative of this would be the derivative of the outside. So f prime of g of x times the derivative of the inside, so times g prime of x. So the derivative of f of x would be 2x. But if we're going to take the derivative of f, uh, if we're going to take the derivative of g of x, so if we're going to have, find f prime of g of x, all you're doing is replacing that x as g of x, because that's your input. So this would be 2x, or no, sorry, 2g of x, 2 times g of x and then times the derivative of g of x. We don't know, we don't have the expression of g of x, we just can write it as g, so we leave it as g prime of x. And that's really as far as you can go. So our answer will be d. All right, so we have the slope field for the differential equation given here. If y equals g of x is the solution to the differential equation with this initial condition, g of negative 2 equals 1, then what's the limit as x goes to infinity of g of x? Okay, so you basically just have to understand what um, this slope field tells you about the function. So um, remember, this slope field basically will tell you the slopes of the function at you know all these points so um if we want to find you know what g of x looks like where it's going to go through this point because there's again this is there's a lot of potential there's a whole family we say of g of x functions depending on um depending on um your um constant or initial conditions so to speak that's how we say it. So if it has this initial condition, that means we go to this point, which is going to be something like negative 2, negative 1, so something like over here. So negative 3 is over there. So, And then we just use these um, slopes kind of to guide what would this graph look like if it, if it went through this point. So we just kind of guide it like this. And you can see that it's like, that it, has, it seems to be very, have like an asymptote at x equals 0. Or no, y equals zero at this line. So it's gonna go to looks like it's gonna go to infinity. So I mean well as x goes to infinity, it's gonna approach this line with the x-axis, so we would say it's zero. Alright, and then um for number nine. If f double prime of x is x times x plus 2 squared, and the graph of f is concave up 4. So to figure out where the graph is concave up, we essentially want to see where um, the second derivative is positive. So um, to find that, we can start off by finding where is the second derivative equal to 0, and then we do like test points around that, inter around that point. So when it's equal to 0, so 
And that would be when x is 0, obviously, and when x is negative 2, because negative 2 plus 2 is 0. So we kind of, you can look at this, look at it like this. I like to do an interval table. So we go from negative infinity oops, to negative 2, then from negative 2 to 0, then from 0 to infinity. So we want to see what's going on with the second derivative in these intervals. So we just pick any value in here. We can pick like negative 10. Um, we'll pick negative 10. We'll pick um, negative 1. And we'll pick like 10. Anything that's easy to work with. And we just see what the sign is when you plug these values into the second derivative. So if you plug negative 10 into here, we get negative 10 times um, a negative 8 squared. But any number squared is is um, positive, so we get negative times a positive. So you would get a negative. So it's concave down here. You put in negative one, you get a negative times a positive again, because any negative squared, is, any number squared is, is negative, or any number squared is positive. So you end up getting a negative. And if you plug in ten, you would get ten times twelve squared, or ten times one hundred forty-four, which is positive. So it's concave down here, but it's concave up here. So we can say it's concave up from zero and up, or when x is more than zero. So our answer is b. All right, here we have, if we're given that y equals the sine of x times the cosine of x, then at x equals pi over three, what's the derivative? So this is going to be product rule. So we're going to have that dy dx will be the derivative of that's sine of x, which would be cosine of x, times cosine of x, plus, now we hold sine of x constant, times the derivative of cosine of x, which is negative sine of x. So essentially you get cosine squared of x minus sine squared of x as your derivative. And to figure out what it is at pi over 3, we just plug pi over 3 into these expressions. So we get the cosine of the cosine of pi over 3 squared. So the cosine of pi over 3 would be 1 half. So we would have 1 half squared minus the sine of pi over 3 squared. The sine of pi over 3 would be root. 3 over 2, so then we square that. So you have 1 fourth minus, it looks like, 3 fourths. And so you get negative 1 half. That's the answer is A. And then for number 11, the limit as x goes to negative 3 of this expression. So if you plug in negative 3 right off the bat, you'll get, you know, 9 minus 9, so we'll get a 0 over 9 minus, or 9 plus 6, so we'll get a 15 minus 15. So you're going to get a 0 over 0 if you plug in negative 3 just the way it is. So you know you kind of want to use some algebraic technique to find a way where you can plug in negative 3 and you won't get in um, an invalid expression. So what we can do is factor. Here we can factor the top into x plus 3 and x minus 3. The bottom will factor to x minus 5 times x plus 3. And here, and then you can cancel those. So now you can plug in negative 3 into the expression. And when you do, you get negative 3 minus, ne minus 3, so you get negative 6. When you get negative 3 minus 5, you get negative 8, which reduces to positive 3 fourths. So your answer is C.